All right, great. So, hey guys, thanks for joining us. Um, appreciate your uh, time and attention this afternoon. So before we get started, just want to do a couple of quick introductions so you know who we are. So Adriana, I'd have you go first. Sure. Uh, Adriana Schneider. I am an engagement engineer with Imagine It. Um, my background is in architectural engineering, went to school for it, did an industry, um, and I have been helping with implementations and training and support for over 20 years for the AEC industry. And I'm Caleb Funk. I am on the same team as Adriana. I've been with Imagine It for about 21 years now, in my case, all in the manufacturing side. So I've done uh, training, implementations, people management, project management, uh, worked with clients and manufacturing on all the different tools that we have over there uh, for that time. And it's the reason there's two of us today. A lot of times when you see one of these events, there's one is because this is all about that interoperability between the design tools on the manufacturing side, specifically Inventor, and the manufacturing, uh, the design tools on the building side, specifically Revit. So that's what we're going to kind of go through. And I do want to talk a little bit about how we got here. So there's this history of interoperability between building design and manufacturing. And at its base level, so I mentioned I've been doing this for 21 years. My first, uh, when I first was doing designs, it was AutoCAD 14. And if I needed to interact with a building designer, good news, they were probably using AutoCAD 14. Actually, I take that back. Um, I have found that building designers aren't, uh, some, there's sometimes a few releases back. So maybe they were on 12, but that's okay. I had a DWG, they had a DWG. We can share this information. It was super easy. If you needed, um, if Adriana needed a, you know, this robot uh, th that I had designed to drop into her factory floor, great. Here's a DWG file and you put it in. Then this happened. We moved on and suddenly we're doing models of these things. And when AutoCAD kind of fell to the background and we're seeing this specialization of tools take place. So with Inventor, now we're doing uh, 3D modeling using this ACES kernel and later the Inventor Shape Manager. And we've got a very specific modeling database, very specific modeling language, ways that we manage these files and all of that. And then we see over on the Revit side, again, we've got a, there's a different uh, modeling manager, a different database, different way of leveraging those tools. And all of a sudden we were stuck a little bit these didn't really talk to each other and for a while there was no good way to exchange this information i mentioned dwg a minute ago that didn't go away there was still an awful lot of just passing a you know well i guess give me the 2d of that and i'll work off of it the idea of working with the 3d it was a it was a fight it really was for quite some time adriana do you have anything to add to that that's just kind of my perspective from the manufacturing side yeah, and I think that the other piece of it, too, was that disconnect of information, right? Because whatever we need on the AEC side of things would be great to be received from the manufacturer. But because of the disconnect of software tools and products, there really was a disconnect of that data and information. So we weren't just manually redoing things sometimes twice. It could be three or four times down the line. Um, adding data and information that we needed to present. And that's an interesting point. We'll actually revisit that just a little bit later on. Um, a lot of times when I'm thinking of interoperability, from my side of it, I'm thinking of modeling tools and geometry and those types of things. And just from having worked with this with Adriana, a lot of times you're thinking in terms of data. <laughs> yes, the model exactly. is part of it, but there's the data behind it as well. So. Yep. Yep, and we'll see some of that when we talk about uh, some things here in a moment. So we have this idea, it used to be really easy, we just throw DWGs over. All of a sudden we've got two different worlds that we're living in and you know two different ways of thinking. So what we started to see is um, back in Inventor 2016, there was this idea that you could import a Revit file as a dumb model. And up to this point, all we could do is share DWGs or SAT files, so you know, very limited exchange. But now we could import Revit. Import Revit. It does come in as a dumb model, so it's a file that comes in, but it's definitely doesn't have any intelligence to it. You could then export out to a Revit family. 
and then that was it for a while. Like we could bring in a Revit mile file and we could export to Revit family. That's what we could do. Then 2021, they added AnyCAD for Revit. So rather than importing it, we can now link the Revit file in so we have access to it. Then they added being able to export an inventor file as a Revit native. So now I can take my things in inventor and they become RVT files that can be consumed by Revit. And then in 2023, we've got data exchanges. This is Some of this is being mirrored on the Revit side. There's other tools that are being added. And we mentioned the DWGs and uh, SAT files. And now we've got the data exchanges that are part of this. Two things I would point out here. Um, one is you, you see that cadence that's building up. You know, there isn't much till 2016. Then there's something new in 2021, 2022, 2023. This drumbeat that we're hearing is, uh, is we're hearing this across the board from so many clients who are saying, we need to be able to do this. I'm creating a, a chiller. I'm creating a uh, variable air unit. I'm creating a uh, air conditioning unit. I'm, whatever it is, this needs to go into, I'm creating a, fa a uh, you know, layout for a factory floor. This needs to end up over in Revit. How do we do that? This conversation is happening more and more and more. So that makes sense that, you know, we're, as that, that interoperability request is there, we're seeing the tools up here for that as well. The other thing that I would point out is so much of this is actually on the inventor side. Revit has data exchanges. We'll talk about those and how we can, how that data kind of flows through and how we can share that with each other. But a lot of the interoperability is really on Inventor, being able to bring the Revit information in and then ultimately get something out to Revit. So with this, we're gonna get kind of an overview of how this interoperability works. But I wanna talk a little bit about kind of why it works, you know, how we end up here. So if I look at a product manufacturing, um, you know, kind of life cycle or the, phases that we would go through, you know, there might be a concept, then we have, you know, we, there's, I have this idea that I, I have or something. In my case, we're going to look at a solar panel. So I've got this design, this concept, and then I would go into product design. And then a lot of times in this space, we are engineering them to order. It's like, yep, I've got this thing, but someone needs it bigger, smaller, wider, taller, whatever it is. I need to be able to work with that. So a lot of times we'll have that engineer to order phase and of course manufacturing and then finally service. So these phases, almost no matter what you design, it, these are very similar phases. And they have, uh, there's an analogous version on the building design side. Yeah, so I mean, the reality is, is we have the same five phases, <laughs> just named a little bit differently, a little bit different process. But, you know, we start off with the conceptual design phase, especially when it comes to a new build, um, bring that into schematic design to lay out the spaces, start getting all that information in to design development, which is really, and Caleb will mirror this in a minute, where we kind of overlap. Um, then from there, the additional data and information that I'm referring to gets added in construction documentation and then construction admin when we're getting ready to build out in the field. So that data, that information, that space planning all needs to uh, move from that early on conceptual and schematic design phase all the way through the construction administration. But the reality is, is sometimes it changes and we need to be able to communicate and obtain the correct information that the manufacturer can provide us fr directly from them if we can. We also so, need to be able to, oh, sorry, we also need to be able to uh, utilize our own internal, when I say internal, in our own firms, content that we've created, families, things like that, um, that we can utilize as placeholders before we receive the information and the uh, families from the manufacturers. But that basically means that there needs to be that similarity, right? The same size, the same information, those types of things. So Adriana mentioned that overlap and what you see, here's the two cycles and it overlaps a little like this. Some of the edges are fuzzy, 
but definitely somewhere in that design development and the idea of saying, hey, we need this component. You know, we want to get um, we want to get more specific about what we have instead of space planning and that. This is where they kind of, you know, we see a little overlap on each end, but this is really where it's at once we get into here. And that's what we're going to focus on, talking about how we can work in that space to make these products uh, where we're sharing that information and make them work together. I do want to get one more idea across before we dig into the workflow and how we're going to we're going to do that. And coming from a, um, a manufacturing background, this was a new one to me. But it's this idea of level of development, and this is kind of specific to BIM, right, Adriana? Yeah, and so um, this acronym LOD was originally used by Vico Software. Um, they're a construction costing software company. If you haven't heard of them. And it was to meant to stand for a level of detail while it was creating its model progression specifications. Now, the company was one of the first ones that developed techniques for pricing directly from building information modeling. So they were kind of ahead of their time and they used the uh, acronym LOD to track how definitive price estimates were. Then the AAA adopted the concept in 2008, but made a few different changes. Um, although they kept the acronym of LOD, they changed it to mean level of development instead of level of detail. Really, and I, I get this, right? The, the idea was that the word detail was going to be interpreted a little too much about graphical representation, whereas development referred to the information of the object itself. So you can see that, you know, in the beginning, it kind of like is a bell curve almost, right? At the beginning, it's very much about presentation, right? Um, you know, you're trying to communicate your design intent and what it's going to look like at the end of the day, but the data doesn't really matter as much. But then as you move to the later LODs, the data becomes a lot more valuable and, uh, excuse me, necessary. And in the middle where we're looking at that documentation, because we still, very many of us continue to have our product I believe our product is our drawings, right? So the drawings themselves are about this is where this thing is, but the information is really what is placed on the drawings as schedules and uh, legends and things like that. Um, yeah, just making sure I'm completing my, my thought, yes. <laughs> so with this, this was really interesting to me when this idea was introduced because in Inventor, we have a thing called level of detail. Well, we used to have a thing. Now we've got model states we can work with, but it was called level of detail. And that, this LOD, I'm like, oh, level of detail, got it. The thing that I want to point out is that it's not just about what it looks like. It's also about the information associated to it. And this is kind of key for passing that along. Again, I'm thinking in terms of exchanging models. I'm thinking, you know, what how detailed do you want the model but it's not just the model it's the information and that's key so let's Absolutely. take a look take a look at a couple of examples of how we would do this and there's two different ways that we can think about this now adriana mentioned one a moment ago the idea of uh internal catalogs or revit families so if I'm a manufacturer, let's say I'm doing that casework there. I've got a client I work with who does uh, specialty equipment for dentist office, one of them being casework. If there's something that has multiple sizes, parameters that can be changed, it's bigger, it's smaller, it's shorter, it's taller. It's if we have something like that, a product line, and I want to share this entire product line with a building designer, that information really should be created in Revit. And we'll talk, I'll mention why here in just a moment, but the idea is those families really should be created in Revit and that's where the information should go. So Adriana, could you talk a little bit about just the catalogs and how they work in Revit a little bit? Sure, so we have our parent family um, that is basically the correct geometry. Now it might change in size and things like that, um, but it's it's, you know, one static piece. And then you bring in the different types that are going to have different potentially shapes. Um, 
and sizes of that particular family. So, you know, a window family, things like that. And each one of those are going to be a little bit different. And the way that Revit works is you're creating these catalogs to be able to bring in individual types into your project to keep file sizes small. So when we when I talk to people about, you know, they I'll talk to someone who says, I've got information and I want to create this as BIM information. I, I'm creating um, I'm creating these solar panels and I want that solar panel to be in BIM. My question is always, is it a one-off? Is it an individual piece? Or are we doing this as a catalog where there's 10 different variations of it? What you should really do if it's a catalog workflow. It should be probably done within Revit starting from scratch. And you'll look at this workflow, and you're going to see that Revit R all the way across it. Inventor can be leveraged a bit. There are some ways that we can um, have that as a starting point. We can create Revit families, but there's two tricks to it. We, the Revit family we create, it's only one item in that family. So I don't have 10 cabinets. I have one cabinet per family. The other trick is I cannot create a, an inventor, I can't create a Revit family that is going to be hosted. And hosted is it's in a wall, it's in a ceiling, it's in a floor. It can't be a door, it can't be a window. So if you are a door manufacturer, you're gonna use Revit to create those families and that's how you're going to send that out. So I wanna point that out. We talk about generating Revit families from inventor I'm talking about I have a specific component that I want to send the geometry and the information about that component over to Revit. That's where that's going to come in. So what we're really looking at more is this idea of building project manufacturing. And so when we're looking at product manufacturing, this is the idea of engineered order. Um, components can be created in the manufacturing tools. So I'm creating this in Inventor. I'm exporting it as an individual family. There are any Inventor I properties that I have can be exported along with that. There's also additional BIM information. I can choose what type of object it is and specific BIM information gets put in there with that. So this gets exported out um, along with that. And the idea here would be, you know, I've got a, um, I've got a dryer, I've got a heater, I've got a, a chiller, I've got a solar panel, I've got a stair, something that here is this component that I've that I'm putting together, and now it's going to be leveraged over in Revit. So this one, we do have Revit. This is the exact workflow that we're going to take a look at here in a moment. The idea would be, we start out, there's Revit, and there's a request. Um, you know, I'm creating something to be consumed in Revit. I can ask the architect or contractor to share the Revit file. And this is done through um, Autodesk Construction Cloud, and we'll show this in a moment. Then I can link into that either with my vault or I can reference it directly in Inventor. We'll show some couple ways to do that. I create information in Inventor. I can then export it out as a Revit family. It's going to have the model information as well as the BIM information that goes into Revit. And then any changes that of the Revit model, I can see reflected within Inventor and I can then republish my information so that it goes out to the construction cloud. Okay, so in this case, we're starting with I need Revit information so that I can build my model around it and then export it back to Revit. So we're seeing that round trip workflow. So this workflow is going to involve a lot of different tools, and for our purposes, one we're going to involve is um, part of the Autodesk Construction Cloud. So Adriana, have you talked a little bit about you know? You know Autodesk Docs and what we're going to use that for. Yep. So um, Autodesk Docs allows us to have a cloud-based solution of where our files are stored and how we collaborate on our end, um, starting from design all the way through handover and operations. But because of its integration with Rev oh, excuse me, with Vault, it allows us to be able to communicate with our manufacturers as well. So you very simply can set up a project structure, a folder structure, add the different users, give the manufacturer, the owner, the uh, contractor, different permission levels uh, of what they can see, what they can do with the different files to be able to share all of that. And 
collaborating from a design perspective all the way through going into the build for change orders and issues and uh, things like that. So on the inventor side, if you used inventor, you're probably familiar with the idea of how important Vault is for data management. This is uh, what we're seeing here with Docs. This is a data management tool being used on the, um, the side for building design, and then they do integrate. So we're, this is one thing we're going to do. We're going to set this up. There's going to be a project structure. We're going to have users associated to this. And this is what we have to kind of set up initially. We go through and we talk through the idea of what, you know, how are we going to collaborate? Okay, we've got that set up. What is going to be created? You know, how are we going to share this information? What services are a part of this? And of course, the idea of what level of development do we want, right? That all has to be discussed as we move into this. How are we collaborating? What do you want from the manufacturer when we're done, when we send that out? Once we have those concepts in place, then we can start taking a look at how to do this. And these are some of the things that we're going to do. We're going to create... Well, go ahead. Sorry, really quick to go back to that. And what's really nice about this is if you're working throughout the entire phase, all the entire project life cycle, it allows us to be able to get, get a family from the manufacturer, if need be, for LOD 100 with materials and things like that to be able to place things. And then be able to utilize our own more conceptual type families that might not necessarily have all the bells and whistles for design development and construction documentation. And then bring that back with families getting from the manufacturer because now the information is really what's valuable that you're gonna to want to bring in to to uh, create your specifications, your schedules, and things like that. Thanks, Caleb. Yep, so this is how we're gonna do that. We're gonna have a couple of specific tools we're gonna use. One is the idea of a Revit data exchange. Yeah. And this is a way that we're gonna be able to take this really complicated Revit model and simplify it down for just the portion that I'm gonna need to work with. We're then going to be able to pull that Revit information into Inventor. Uh, work with it, be able to use it as the basis for creating new geometry, create a Revit family from Inventor, and then send that back to Autodesk Docs through Vault. So there's a way that we can link those up so that those kind of go through. And this is kind of what we're going to walk through for this. So that data exchange is going to be one of the first key parts of this. So Adriana, have you just kind of speak a little bit to on your side what a data exchange is and how that works? Sure. So one of the things about the data exchange is you're not actually doing it through Revit. You're doing it through Autodesk Document Management. So with the Revit file itself, utilizing whether it be you know Docs by itself or Design Collaboration or Collaborate Pro, whatever it's called these days. Um, that then gets stored and published out to the Autodesk Docs platform. Using the Autodesk Docs, you move to the folder that is actually stored in, going to the view. So you, I, I created specifically a view um, that just showed the solar panels from the conceptual design stage um, and able to take that and send it out to uh, another folder for the manufacturer to be able to grab. So again, it's all about setting up those permissions and those rules of who can see what. And so that can be sent out to uh, the manufacturer folder so that Caleb can co-grab it. Yep. And on my end, once I bring that in, I can then begin creating my inventor files around that. Um, from there, I would go through and create a substitute. And I can do that through a variety of ways, whether it's the derive command or whatever it would be, then I've got specific BIM export tools. Ultimately then, I'm going to sync this to Autodesk Docs, and I can do that through my vault, and I'll point that out and kind of walk through a little bit of how that works within here. And keep my eye on the time, and I think we're doing all right. So we've got this full thing that we're going to do. It's going to start out, there's a Revit model. I need access to it. Adriana is going to give me access to it. I get to pull it into Inventor, work with it in Inventor, be able to define a family, be able to take my model, excuse me, apply specific information to it, export it as a family, send it back to her and to Docs, where she'll be able to pull it into Revit and use it as part of that. 
So let's take a look at how all this works, you know, how these pieces actually go through. So Adriana, I would have you um, just kind of start out showing the model there within what we're going to be working with within Revit so we can uh, have a sense of that. So I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay, good, because I don't think I can do that myself. <laughs> nope, you can't take it. I got to give it. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so here we have our Revit model. Um, so this is the full 3D model. We're looking at a hospital project here. Um, and you know, with the solar panels, I knew what sizes I needed. I knew some of the basic information. Um, again, it, it, it this allows you in Revit to be able to do what you need. Right. So if in reality you're simply looking for more tagging purposes, being able to show where they are, laid them out, you can just simply utilize a uh, conceptual block. Or if you actually really needed the actual uh, solar panel itself for more uh, presentation purposes, you can place that in there. But again, it's all you, all your work that you're doing. So from there, we build this 3D model that we showed you. Um, and then push it out to Autodesk Docs. So go here, um, so this is our Autodesk Docs platform and my hospital project is right over here, 51610 Hospital Drive. Bring the, br excuse me, go over to the document management files folder structure that I have. You'll notice that I have the manufacturer folder, the mechanical, the architectural. I'm gonna go into the architectural folder here, you'll notice that we're on six versions. So as I'm working, you're able to see the additional versions that it's pushing out, comparing the different versions if necessary. And then from there, um, coming in here, selecting to create that data exchange allows me to then scroll through, find the folder that I want, so here we have manufacturing and select that name it what it is I need and create the exchange. So that's another nice feature of it as well um, is being able to push it where you need to um, to the particular project. Docs recognizes what project you're working in so you don't have to go uh, searching for that. Hand that back to uh, Mr. Caleb. Okay, so Adriana has specific project folders. She's got different things. Here's the kind of cool thing on my end. I'm not going to worry about it. All I'm going to do is go over here to my collaborate and I can take a look at this data exchange. I'm signed in as me. So I'm signed into my Autodesk account. This goes, look, goes and looks at my account and looks for data exchanges in this project. I'm not worried about folders. All I'm looking for, what are the available data exchanges as part of this hospital drive project? And sure enough, there is one. When I preview it, it's exactly what she had a moment ago. We're looking at the same information. This is using the um, the Forge uh, viewer, by the way, and you'll see this in all the different products, but I can see what I have and I'm gonna load that in. So I don't have to have an email sent to me. I don't have to store a particular file. All I have to do is go ahead and access that data exchange, which has been set up, and it pulls directly in. And this is one of the new things for 2023, and one of the uh, benefits of being able to work with that is how cleanly I can take a very specific part of the model that's being set up for me, the only area I need to work with and concern myself with, and now I can go view that. A couple of things are kind of interesting about this. This does not import it the way we would traditionally think of. Um, this is a data exchange. It's very specific. And you can actually see that it's got a cloud icon over here. And I can ha I have access to all of the pieces that are in here. So all of the different things uh, that are part of this. You can see she's got these you know, real simple placeholders. I'm just gonna go, uh, Take a look at that. I'll take any one of those. I really don't care which one, and I'm gonna isolate it. I just wanna see just that one. Because what I want to do now here within my um, inventor is I want to be able to take this as the basis for my design. She's got this space claim created. I need something that's going to fit in here and a whether it's going to be in a, um, 
you know, when I start designing my model, I have to be able to fit in here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to basically steal some geometry from this. And I'll just call this space claim for now. And I'll say, okay, sounds good. I'll kind of work off of that. I can do things that I would typically think of when I'm working with this geometry. Uh, I can come in here and I can project it. I can extrude it. I can begin working with it. All of the standard type of inventor sort of things, right? I'll extrude this, let's say, uh, we will go to, and I'll go to this other surface over here. So now what I've created is this space claim object, which I'll go open by itself. That's really just an, a set of empty surfaces, right? I, I just have a general area where I'm going to start working on this, where I can begin bringing in my components and assembling them together if I'm doing something like um, uh, where I'm going to do some different types of modeling or whatever, uh, skeletal modeling. I have access to all of that. So if I wanted to, I could now say, well, let's you know begin using this as the basis for how I want to lay these pieces out. And I'll come in here and project some geometry real quick. This will be one of my pieces. And this is a, just to you know, give you an example, three by four, let's say, this is a, a support piece that I'll have. And maybe this is the first piece that I'm laying out as part of that. Actually, I'm gonna switch off of that. And then I will you know, run to the other side over here. Oh, I gotta run to that point, there we go. And as I go on, I go on, I can begin putting these, you know, begin putting this together so I can build my panel based off of the space that she's given me. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit instead of watching me do a bunch of inventor modeling pieces here. This is where we end up, is I can take that uh, information that uh, she's given me. And again, if it updates and changes, I'll, I'll be able to see that and I can see the uh, where that's at and where the information is. If it updates, if I've referenced it, that reference will update. My case, I've gone through, I've created uh, the panel based off, you know, the area and the information and spaces that she's given me. So that's, we're able to do the first part of the workflow. I'm bringing in the Revit information, referencing the Revit information, creating my inventor models based off the Revit information. Now I want to start the second part of that workflow where I take this, add the BIM information to it so I get the correct level of development, then take that and drop it into my vault so that I can um, set it up and automatically push it back to her in the construction cloud. So to do that, I'm gonna take a look here at just this environment. I have a specific environment called BIM content that's within here. And like a lot of inventor tools, you will you can work left to right as you go through. So a couple things I wanna point out, I'm not gonna do it yet, but there's this idea of simplify. And simplify is important because I don't want to send all of these hollowed out pieces with every single lug and every single hole and every single wire and connection that I have on this back to Revit. I want to depending on the level of development what we're talking about, I want to be able to talk through, you know, what do you need to see? And we've already predetermined what geometry I'm sending and what information I'm sending. That's at the beginning of the project, like we talked about. I can add additional things. If this is, for example, a piece of duct, I can add a duct connector so that Revit MEP can attach to it. Same thing with pipe, same thing with the electrical connector or conduit or cable tray. Those are specific connectors that Revit MEP is looking for so that when it begins laying out a system, it can link to them. So if I'm building, you know, maybe I'm working in sheet metal and I've got this really specific eccentric reducer that I'm creating over here in Inventor Sheet Metal that I want to send back to Revit, I can add those connection points. In my case, if I had all of my electronics on here, I could add an electrical connection point for how this is going to be wired into the building. All of that can be part of it. Once I have created my different points on here, I'm going to go through and um, I'll mention it here, just the idea of the UCS. This is just, it shows where my UCS is and I can relocate it. This is something you, you'll you learn through experience. Revit and Inventor have different ways of looking at things sometimes. So I've already set it up, but you may have to really think through how you want to position your coordinates as it goes in. What I wanna do is go through and author these building components. And I can come in here and 
again, I can choose my insertion point. I can begin putting this, this information in. I can give this a family name. And another key thing is I have this what's called Omniclass in here. And by choosing this class, you know, what this item is, this allows me then to put in specific specific information. So Adriana, could you talk just a little about Omniclass and kind of, it, I know it's a, here's what I know, it's a BIM thing, and that's about where it ends for me, and I know which one to pick. So could you kind of point out what that is a little bit? Sure, you can see here too that it is, um, assigned to the different Revit categories, right? So it drills down and gives you some additional information, potentially could be um, implemented with, you know, Kobe data and things like that. Um, but just, you know, specifications to, to the different uh, content and, and how it's going to be used. So this is important because it's going to determine how it shows up in Revit. So what, you know, is it casework? Is it electrical equipment? You know, what is it? And by choosing electrical generator, I have all of this additional information. This is the that level of development we were talking about. You know, I can fill out um, all of this additional information about this so that we have uh, so that we can go through and understand when they run reports, when they run queries, when they look at those things, all of the information can be in as part of this. So I can fill all of this out. I can also put in any model property that I want to. So I can go through and take a look at any inventor model property, any of my I properties, all of that can go along with it as BIM information as well. So we've got a, a lot of information, what goes with it in terms of geometry and what goes with it in terms of BIM data, it's all what level of development is being requested. But what I wanna do is I've gone through I've set it up. So I've already really got established. Go ahead. Quick before you move forward with that, I think it's really valuable to understand. You know, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is the communication, right? Having back and forth communication and the Omni class, the category, all of that is very important to communicate early on. So when you're looking at things like BIM execution plans or having those discussions, those are really great things to have for your bit in your BIM standards um, because it is what's going to uh, allow the manufacturer content to properly uh, be viewed within that Revit model. Also, when uh, Caleb talked about simplifying, part of the value there is now electrical engineers can connect to their panels. Now mechanical engineers can add to you know their schedules because that data and information is loaded from the manufacturer uh, to be utilized and it's the accurate information, which is really what we're looking for. So what I'll do then, now that I've got all of that established, we've got all this information in place, I'm gonna go ahead and export this component. Now, it gives me a warning, it says, hey, I recommend you use a substitute. Do you wanna go ahead and go with simplify before you do this? So this is really the same thing as if I had hit this button at the beginning, right? And I could have um, simplified that information from the start and I've got some options on how do I want this to appear. Um, you know, I'll go ahead and fill in, for example, all of these holes and tunnels that I have here. Uh, that sounds good to me. We'll we'll go through and um, fill that information in so that we've got that appropriate. And I'll say, okay, that sounds good. Let's simplify this out. So now we've got a much simpler version of this. It's removed my lugs. It's gone through and filled in. Um, you know, where my, I had my frame members before, now they're just really simple information. Now I'm gonna go back to my export building components. So it kind of stopped me for a minute and said, hey, you sure? Yeah, okay, now I'm sure. So what I will do is I'll export this as a Caleb Co. solar panel. I'm gonna go ahead and save this out. Notice that by the time I get to this point, once I hit export, all I'm doing is choosing a location of where it goes. I have already simplified it. I've already set up my UCS where I want to do it. I've already set up my building. You know, I said put in all of my information in terms of uh, my BIM information. So export, that's all it does. Author is really what it's all about. Authoring it, putting, you know, building that additional BIM information into there is probably much more important than just, hey, save this outside. But I'll go ahead and do that. So, yep. Uh, I have to save it as a different name because I've done this once before, so we'll call it panel one. So, yep, sounds good. Okay, so I've saved it out. Now, 
I have to get it back to Adriana. So when I do this, um, I'm going to, there's a couple, I have a lot of options, honestly. Literally, I could email it, right? I could use the, the desktop connector if I'm connected uh, to Autodesk Docs and I could drop it in that way. That's a possibility. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my vault to link to that. So I'm gonna jump over here to my vault. And if you're not familiar with Autodesk Vault, this is a data management tool that Autodesk has. I'm specifically using Vault Professional. And Vault Professional has uh, some tools in here that are really beneficial. And one of them that I'm gonna use is the idea of being able to link back to that construction cloud. So I'll go grab my solar panels. Hey, that sounds great. Yep, sounds good, drop it in there. So I'll pull that file in. And I can go so far as to do all of the things I would typically think of with Vault. I'm gonna change its category, for example, here we'll make this an engineering file, which is allow me to going to allow me to release that file. So I can control which version I'm dealing with. You know, I can control all that information. I don't wanna change that, I just wanna change the state, excuse me. Uh, within Vault. And this is a you know really powerful data management tool that determines all of these things. I want to go a step further. This is my data management tool, and I want to be able to link this to uh, Adriana's data management tool on the building design side. So to do that, I can go through and I can collaborate. So just like we had the collaborate tab in Inventor, I've got collaborate here, and I can... Uh, just give it a name here. I'm gonna say this particular vault folder and I'm looking at my vault and I'm going to collaborate with Autodesk Docs. And if I take a look right here, I've got that hospital project. And what do you know, I've got the folders. So those same folder structure she was showing earlier, that information, she gave me access to that, so I have it. And then I can set it up to say, all right, we're going to take this Revit Families folder and I can even, and I'm going to upload that to the cloud drive. So there's a couple things I can do. I could only download things from a cloud drive. Maybe I'm just consuming some information from there. I can have bi-directional sync. In my experience, it's probably best to either upload or download. Bi-directional sync can get a there's some things to consider when we're looking at that. We can put a specific filter so I can say only files that are released, only PDFs, only RFAs get pushed up. Anything else in this folder, ignore. And I can set a schedule. So every night at midnight, it pushes that file up there, right? So what I'm gonna do is we'll push this right now. We'll just take this particular file and I'm gonna set this linking up. We're gonna push it so that it um, pushes that information up to the cloud. And then once we're up there, Adriana is going to be able to access that on her end so that she can take that information that I gave her, that family, load it into Revit, and then be able to bring that in and see some changes on her side. Yep. So wait a minute. I'll make sure that I stay here. Um, so going back to um, the folder structure. Sorry, you guys are in my room. Um, so going to the um, folder um, 3D for the solar panel, I have this, um, and then I have the ability then to load that into Revit itself. So in Revit, selecting the placeholder that I have, I can simply, you know, select all instances in this view because it is of the correct category, I can simply flip it from one to the other. And so now I've replaced all of them um, for the actual solar panels. So that's the idea of round tripping all of that information, being able to take from one to the other. Adriana, could you go ahead and pass it back to me and I will kind of wrap up here with the um... Sure, one second. Talk. I just wanted to okay, show that all that information that you had brought in um, is actually located within the family in the type properties too. OK, 
Okay, so we used a lot of different tools to get here. The thing to remember is largely all of my design work is being done in Inventor, all of Adriana's is being done in Revit. What we're doing is we're using Vault and we're using the Autodesk Construction Cloud as a way to talk back and forth, right? That's how we're doing that. And you can take a look, there's all these you know, different things that we can do, different areas that we're going to do them in. I will point out that we keep talking as though we're two separate companies. I have some clients who are doing this within a single company. There's a project side and there's a product side. So you know, a product gets built and then we have to put in, it's a large, gonna be part of a large system. So there's a project side that needs to then put that into Revit. And again, how do we pass that information back and forth? That's what we wanted to and, review. And, and one more thing to add there, that is something that actually is being, we talk a lot about building information modeling. Um, if you've ever been on a meeting with me, talk about adding new revenue streams to your own firm. And there's a lot of firms that are doing that now, that are actually fabricating what they are, are designing within a building and then fabricating it for building it. Um, and so we're hearing, hearing a lot more about those types of tasks that are being um, added on to a firm's business objective. So just to kind of review, this is what we talked about a little bit, right? The idea of project inception, figuring out those standards, what is going to be exchanged, how are we going to exchange it? And then when we got down to the nitty gritty, we said, okay, here's the here's how do we do it. There's the creation of the data exchange, leveraging that Revit data in Inventor, Take an inventor model, creating it based off of that, exporting it as a BIM object, and then finally syncing that up with Autodesk Docs. So that's, a, you know, we're able to round trip that information, move all the way through, um, sharing that at each point. So that's the presentation we wanted to go through and give you a sense of how you could do that. Uh, if you'd watch the other one, there's, you know, a whole, there's a whole other series that was done by some of our colleagues that talked about more of a project level. In this case, we're talking about a product level. So there's two different. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.